Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard. You're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Friska Wiria. Friska Wiria brings digital transformation to life by accelerating adoption and building proficiency at scale. Having worked for some of the biggest names in mining, engineering, and technology, a change and transformation expert for nearly a decade, she's led change programs influencing up to 23,000 people across the seven continents, technology implementations, operating model designs, M&As, and restructures. Through her experience driving change around the world, she's had to hone her influence, communication, and persuasive ability to be able to get people of all backgrounds to do things differently from the way they've always been done. Welcome to the podcast, Maria. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So um, just so people can get to know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, your story, and how you got to be doing what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. So um, as you said in my intro, I help organizations and the individuals within them more rapidly accept and thrive through change. So I've been doing that for nearly a decade now, applying my learnings in cities as diverse as Melbourne to Mumbai to Manado. And it came because I have had to change my own life multiple times. um, And now I help organizations do the same. Wow. Wow. So, and you are from Australia. Yes, uh, most of my life I've lived here, um, but I did spend four years in Los Angeles. Okay, wow, across across Mm. the world then. Mm. Wonderful. And what is it about what you do that gives you the energy and the motivation to wake up every morning? I think because every day is different and there's no cookie cutter approach. Every organization is different. Some changes may be similar, but um, you can't just pull a toolkit out of the box and apply it to the same in every single company because it depends uh, on the leaders. It depends how good you communicate. And it also depends on the culture of an organization. So it's it's like a puzzle to me. And that's what keeps me going. I like diversity. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And what do you mean when you talk about diversity? As in... Um, like a change manager's job, it's not uh, the same in, uh, for example, I could be acting like a chief of staff, helping the CEO of a company uh, put together his town hall presentation. I would help him rehearse, rehearse. I could put him together the talking points. And then the next day I could literally be out um, on the front line because I have worked with the police very closely, literally in the back of their police van, seeing how they interact with different pieces of technology, um, identifying opportunities to improve their proficiency. So, yeah, that's what I mean by the diversity. It's, it's, it's not a one size fits all sort of role. Mm-hmm. So tell me about that working with the police. Any great stories about that or any aha moments during that time? That was by far the what my, one of my best memories. So it was a $42 million technology implementation, uh, the largest of its kind for the world's single largest police jurisdiction. And they were the role was to help them replace its CAD system. CAD stands for Computer Aided Dispatch. And it's the system that all the other platforms and other government departments integrate to. So it was literally like a heart and lung transplant. The old heart was 10 years old. And, you know, in 10 years, technology has progressed rapidly. So it was like going from the blue screen MS-DOS to the latest generation iPhone. And so I had to take the heart out, replace it with a brand new heart, a pacemaker, if you will, and then reattach all the arteries and the systems back together again. Why I enjoyed it so much is that it was just so different. I was out you know, on the speedboats with the water police. I was out in the stables um, with the with the mounted police, um, with the canines, um, was in helicopters. I even did the obstacle course. So it was very much an immersive change. And because the impact of getting that right or wrong uh, was life or death, like imagine sending, you know, a, a triple zero. Well, in, for those in America, a 911 call, imagine sending dispatching police cars to the wrong location like it it, the stakes were high so that's why it was one of the most fulfilling projects I've ever had wow so you worked with talk about it talk about diversity Mm. (laughs) from the horses to the whatever and to the miners (laughs) miners to the the everything so 
Mm. And I'm sure they all had, you know, different personalities and even, you know, within the, the groups within the police, I'm sure, you know, the people who rode horses had a totally different personality to the people who were in cars or on boats or whatever. Oh, very different. Cultures yeah, within very different. cultures. So, and, and then you're bringing in something new and I don't know about anyone else, but I hate it when they bring in a new computer system. And you mm. weren't just talking about a computer system. You were talking about a, an overhaul. Of yeah, a yeah, system. an overhaul. Yeah. So with all these people and all these personalities and possible attitudes <laughs> about things or feelings about mm. how, you know, change or not wanting to change, how did you get buy-in? Well, this is the thing. Um, people give up too easily. They think that after one meeting, everybody's supposed to love it and sign on the dotted line and say, yes, I support it. It doesn't work like that. So I re you just have to be really consistent, persistent and dedicated. Like anything in life, that's worth having. having. Those are the three qualities. Um, when it comes to how to get by, and you have to start with the basics. You really have to get to know who you're talking to. So really get into their head. What are their fears? What are their desires? How can you motivate them? If you can't influence them, then find out who can widen that sphere of influence. And, you know, that project impacted seven and a half thousand officers, um, one and a half thousand civilians, and it enabled, you know, the entire state of Western Australia to maintain its quality of life. So that's about 1.2 million. And you cannot execute a change of that scale by yourself. And that's why it's so important to build the capability of um, an organization's leaders to role model the change, to advocate for the change, make sure that they know what their role is in bringing this change to life. It's not just about signing off on budget. You know, it's about making your personal commitments to the people that are resistant um, and being clear about what you will do to help this, to help make this a success. So, I mean, change is not a spectator sport and where a lot of organizations fall over is that they think it's my job. They think it's the change manager's job to manage resistance. It's not, we can help you develop the strategy. We can pinpoint areas of contention, but it's you as a leader um, that have to you know, pull up your sleeves and get and do your part. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of times there's things that people in upper management or the CEO, they wanna implement or change, but they, you know, they have these huge organizations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the people who are more in the peripheral of the an organization where they're not up by the heart, where the decisions are being made, mm -hmm. um, they might not really understand why it is these changes are happening, or they might not um, buy in just based on the, the, they just don't see the reason for it. So yeah. Yeah. if someone um, who is in leadership wants to make those changes, how do you work with people to help them understand what their piece is or what their what's the importance of what they're doing and why it's important to change as in a leader why what's the importance of it, what they're doing right so how is it that they communicate to the people who are working with them at the different levels to get mm -hmm. them to actually um, understand their importance or their piece in it because sometimes you know, yeah. people think, well, the CEO is the most important, but you know, my yeah. role is not that much. You know, it doesn't matter I see, what I, see. I do. Yep. Yep. You actually touched upon the answer earlier when you asked me the question, and that is always being crystal clear and repeating over and over again, why, 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 what is the benefit, not just to the organization, but, but to their department and how it links to their role. That is ultimately the most important. And in terms of um, how leaders can best communicate with their teams, to encourage them to adopt and be more open to change. Um, I call it the five C's and that is context, consistency, clarity, um, uh, conciseness and commitment. And the first one is the most difficult and that is context because leaders have been privy to information that people lower down the ranks have not, sometimes for weeks, months on end. So when they, they often neglect to give that full picture to the people that they're communicating to, and so if they don't do that, they will find it hard to understand, like you said, why are we doing this in the first place? How is it better to what we've got now? So context is key um, to solidifying that understanding. Okay, yeah, exactly. 
because I had an experience, um, I'm an optometrist and I had mm. patients coming in at this certain location where I was working, uh, coming and working from this specific company. Yes. And every time I asked them, hey, what do you do? These mm. people, someone had did a great job of actually educating them because no matter what level they were in the company, they came in and said, this is my job. This is what I do. And we make these really cool things that they're used all over the world. They were these big containers, but Mm. I mean, every person that came in, regardless of what their job title was, they knew what they were doing. They knew how it contributed not only to their company, to the world. So they had somebody going in there with change who really helped people know what their purpose was. Yeah. And once, when you start communicating, it's so important to have your key messages better down, not just better down, but agreed and disseminated to anybody that's involved in the project because you know like in a in a leadership team if say of five if even one of those people aren't speaking with confidence and able to articulate succinctly what it's about and what its benefits will be it undermines any credibility you may have built about that change right any wishy-washy response by leaders because at the end of the day your rank and file employees look to you they look up and they take their cues from you. What should they be paying attention to? What do you feel is important? You know, how passionate are you about making this a reality? Mm-hmm. And do you ever do any kind of, um, I don't know if you call it personality testing or just trying to match people up with the, the, the appropriate jobs or positions they should be in based on their personalities? Um, funnily enough, I'll often send personality quizzes before I start a project just to know how best I should be engaging with them and communicating with them, right? Some people like to have a lot of social niceties beforehand and very super, you know, superfluous language, whereas others prefer facts and figures short and sharp. So I've done personality testing not for not to match people into their roles, but to understand where they're coming from and what they need from me to make them feel confident and to get their buy-in. Wow. So once an organization is actually making these changes, how do they keep it, how do they make it stick? How do they Mm. keep people engaged and enrolled? That's a very good question. And where most organizations fall over is that they under-resource the reinforcement part. Um, First of all, they have to identify misalignments with the change that they're trying to push with their current, for example, systems, values, um, vision. So I'll give you an example. I was uh, the global change lead at a very large engineering company. And the change that I was on was about offshoring work. So sending non-essential, non-client facing work to lower cost countries like India and China. Uh, It was great, save, you know, the intent was to save 30% of expenses there, but, what they didn't realize and had to um, align was that the people in charge of sending the work were project managers. Now, project managers, the way they meet their bonuses and their KPIs is not by delivering the cheapest project. They were measured by client satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And so they had no reason, no motivation, no desire to send work offshore to someone that they didn't know, that they didn't trust, with no guarantee of assurance because that would hit them in their back pocket. So things such as that need to be identified. Um, The metrics and the adoption of the change need to be anchored into um, reward and recognition schemes. Um, I'll give you another example. When I was uh, heading up the change function at the largest gold miner on this ASX, it was focused on digital transformation. And so what we did was identified people who were advocating for us who were supporting us and we then fed the names and the reasons for the for that acknowledgement to very influential people in the in in the business and never underestimate you know the power of a 20 second interaction that a leader will have with someone so one one gentleman um, who was a very well regarded industry statesman before he left to go to visit certain sites I would actually provide him the info of who to speak to who to pat on the back, you know, who to acknowledge. And, you know, as busy as he was, he did it. And that 20 second interaction just went through the site like wildfire. Right. 
So yeah, it was very, very powerful. And yeah. lastly, um, for anything to be sustained, it needs to be supported. So it needs to be integrated to reflect that it's just the way that the business operates now and things like that, like for example, updating people's job descriptions, if it's relevant, you know, creating standard operating procedures. So mechanisms need to be in place so that when the project team disbands and walks away, the change doesn't walk away with it. Mm -hmm. And has it been your experience that after you go in and make these changes and you put in the, the things needed to, to sustain it, is it normally sustained for a year, two years? Um, what has been your experience? Do you ever go back and check in with them and say, okay, how's it going? Yep. Um, how long it's sustained is depends on how long someone is owns the benefits and the ownership of the metrics. Yeah. If no one's measuring it, some it it loses visibility and suddenly it's not important anymore. So it's it's hard to answer. The ones that have consistently measured and assigned a benefits owner to it and it's on the leadership radar the change is still there and it's appropriately resourced as well because change doesn't happen by magic with no effort and no resource no budget no scope right mm -hmm. mm. yeah and just talk about that measuring things so how important is it to measure things in in any area and how do we actually make accurate measurements of things mm. so um Okay, bit by bit. First of all, it's, it's very important to measure because if you don't understand where you are now, how are you supposed to know if you're improving or actually de decreasing in improvement? Um, in terms of measurement, it depends on the change, but there are types of metrics. So there are individual metrics, there are team metrics, and there are organizational metrics. And for example, if you're rolling out a new, I don't know, finance system, it could be um, before you put the new system in, maybe you could process 50 invoices. Now you can process 500. So it's things like that. So, you know, the, the process efficiency, um, the number of people that get on board, how quickly they go to get on board and how proficient they are when they get on board. So those are the three main buckets that together um, measure the ROI of a change management effort. Um, you can also uh, measure qualitative data, like how, how, to, how satisfied people were with the communication, how satisfied they were with the training, um, how engaged they were throughout the process, um, leadership feedback. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining that, because I think that's one of those, um, unless you're, you know, higher in an organization, that's one of those things that you wonder, okay, how do they do that? So yeah, thank you. there's still a lot of um, cloak and dagger mystery around it, mm -hmm. which is also why it's, it's um, still quite a misunderstood discipline and it's very easy to be struck off the budget. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I know that uh, besides actually working with companies, you have several causes that you are really passionate about. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So I, um, I volunteered at Liberty Victoria um, a few years ago, and I was passionate about that because they are the oldest um, civil uh, and human rights advocacy group in Australia. And so I was passionate because I came here as, um, as an immigrant, and it was very, very challenging growing up here back in the 80s. You know, it was very, very racist. Um, I've been spat on, I've been told to go back where I come from, I've had rotten fruit thrown at me, and I don't want anyone to go through the same. So that's a cause um, close to my heart. I also used to volunteer at a few um, women's organisations, helping uh, abused and battered women uh, re-enter the workforce, whether it be polishing their CV, um, you know, uh, personal style, um, interviewing practice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Perth for primary school, then high school in Sydney, then oh. university in California, and then back to Australia, and I'm currently in Sydney. Okay, and being in those different places, do you notice a difference in people from one place to another? 
Uh, yes, extremely. And even in the same city, there's wide differences. Like Sydney is a very big city and um, it's very similar to Los Angeles, right? You, you cross one suburb and it's like going into a different world. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if women want to actually stand out, speak out, be heard, what is your best advice on that? Um, before you open your mouth, know what you're going to say first. So do the inner work to identify uh, your values, um, what you want to be known for. Um, take the time to distill your essence and then only then um, start thinking about uh, content that reflects you, the authentic you. Mm. And if people are finding that they're in a situation where they're um, there is discrimination or, you know, like, like you are, you said, you know, you never want to experience that. What would be your best advice for them? If they're facing discrimination? Um, I would say uh, get support, um, find out who the, who can push that needle forward for you, as in who are the key influences in your organization and then start developing relationships with them and then proactively um, help them achieve their objectives because it's all about the law of recipro um, reciprocation. Mm -hmm. uh, you help first and then it'll come back to you 10 times more. Mm -hmm. So if people wanted to work with you, what kind of companies come to you for, for help? Um, usually very male dominated ones. Um, and I think, <laughs> So my background is mining, engineering, oil and gas, energy, technology. And usually people come to me when they are just frustrated beyond belief. They're not getting the adoption that they want for, for a particular transformation, or they find that um, the relationships between key stakeholders have really deteriorated. Uh, they are struggling to effectively storytell their vision for change and getting people to let alone buy and getting people to even listen is a challenge. Um, those are the areas that I really thrive in. Mm -hmm. And mm. coming into a company as a, a woman in a male dominated uh, yep. company, how are you received? And um, do you have any trouble with that sometimes with men want, not wanting to listen to a woman coming in? Oh God, I'm often the only stiletto in a room full of flats. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not the secretary, FYI. <laughs> um, yes, of course, I've had trouble with that. Um, you just have to, it's a fine line balancing warmth and strength. Um, and so I do very early on, I intentionally um, build credibility, either through I take control of the way I'm introduced. Um, I've, obviously, I've been investing in my personal brand for, for over a year now and it's paying dividends. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, there's a lot you can do before you get into the room. Mm -hmm. You so, just remember that first impressions, you know, are made in less than three seconds. So have your pitch like laser focused and crystal clear. Right. So um, to instill confidence in the people we're meeting, what is the best way to be introduced? Um, the best way to be introduced is to um, take advantage of the halo effect and be introduced by someone very well, well respected and senior in the organization. Wow. Yeah, have someone sing your praises for you. You don't do the singing. Mm -hmm. mm. That's great. Finding, again, just finding support where you need to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I just want to ask a personal question. Mm -hmm. What gives you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life at this point? Um, happiness and fulfillment. Well, I'm a type A person <laughs> and personal fulfillment when I set very lofty goals for myself and I achieve them. Um, connecting with people who share the same 
philosophy, mindset, values, um, that support network um, being lifted up and me helping other people be lifted up and helping others smash through their self-limiting beliefs and increase their confidence. So for example, uh, two days ago, I delivered a one-day workshop for women in construction, uh, engineering and infrastructure. And um, yeah, it was tiring as you can imagine, it was full day on Zoom. And the, you know, the heartfelt thank yous and, you know, that I got afterwards and all the emails that have come in, they, they mean a lot. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, wonderful. And, mm. and speaking of women, I have noticed, because I have um, uh, people I know who are uh, women in construction and women in yeah. oil and gas, and there's starting to be more and more women. Um, how, is, how is it that that's happening and how are they in kind of infiltrating themselves or actually becoming parts of these organizations where it was probably hard to get into even a few years ago. Yeah, um, it all starts from awareness. I think there's been a lot of media about the incredibly um, unequal um, playing field that's existed for decades, you know, cent centuries. And I think organizations are now actually investing resources into attracting women and they are doing they're putting many things in place to make women more comfortable and to make their workplaces more attractive to women from the way their job advertisements are written to the fact that there are now underground toilets in in, in underground mine sites I mean you know a few decades ago that was unheard of mm -hmm. uh, so it's things like that um, that are finally happening in very male dominated industries and it couldn't have happened without the relentless awareness raising and um, championing of the cause. And also it takes some very um, influential male figures to stand up and sponsor these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And as you see women going into those industries, women manage a little differently than men do. Mm -hmm. What kind of changes are you seeing in the environment or the cultures with women coming into the workplace there? Uh, women are more collaborative and consultative generally. Yeah, generally. And they will often um, take input from different people before coming to a decision where I found it's the opposite for males. They'll decide. And then if there's backlash, then they'll kind of check in and get other people's views. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's just my personal experience and my personal um, perception. Mm -hmm. And mm. when, when that's happening, as are the men sometimes thinking uh, thinking or saying, you know, why is it taking them so long to make a decision? Or is, is there a, a problem with that? Yes, yes. Um, and this is what I say to my clients all the time when they, when they say things are taking too long, that, you know, bringing people along um, is taking too long. I always say, look, you can spend a reasonable amount of time engaging people and communicating with them. Or you can spend an unreasonable amount of time battling resistance. And the cost of resistance adds up. Like present absenteeism, people just check out, turnover. I mean, right, the cost of getting someone new is 25% of their salary. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if your turnover just went up 10%. Those costs can be crippling. Mm -hmm. So you can either pay now or you can pay a lot more later. So. Oh, that's great advice. That's really mm -hmm. great advice. So um, if people want to work with you, um, how do they actually find you? I'm on LinkedIn. So you can type my name into the search bar or my website is freshbyfriska.com. And there's details up there how you can get in touch with me. Thank you. And thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for all your wisdom and insights. It's been really, really fascinating. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been lovely to chat. Yes, so I have one last question before we get off. Mm -hmm. What is your best advice on living an incredible, amazing life? Mm. Uh, I've got a few pieces of advice. So family is not only who you are related to, so really cherish and value your friends. Um, I don't have family of my own, so my friends are really the family that I wish I was born with. Um, you always have a choice, no matter how backed into a corner you feel. It may not be your first choice. You may not like it. 
it may not be your plan A, B or C, but you always have a choice. So um, don't be afraid to make one. Um, and lastly, uh, stop judging. Like don't let uh, what people project externally in a meeting, on social media, whatever, don't let someone's outsides determine how you feel on the inside because you never know what goes on behind closed doors. So those are my top three. Right. Well, thank you so much, Miska. And we'll talk to you again soon. You're welcome. Thanks. Mm -hmm.